Good evening, World Outreach Revival Center. We apologize for being a couple of minutes late. It's a technical difficulty, but uh, we hope you as we worship our King tonight. want to give the Lord a hand of praise for those that are in here. Can you make a loud noise? Hundred people, beautiful. Uh, those that are coming online uh, tonight, we want to welcome you. And this is the Wednesday night service, and it's time to worship our King. It's a good thing to know Him. It's a good thing to be a Christian. You know, if I can just be honest for a minute, I don't understand why people don't want to be a Christian, a real one. The strength that comes from Him, the peace that comes from Him, the joy that comes from Him, the hope that comes from Him, the help that comes from Him, the provision that comes from Him, the forgiveness that comes from Him, the healing that comes from Him, the list goes on. It's a wonderful thing to know Him. If you don't know Him tonight, or maybe you're not watching this live and you watch it later on, if you don't know Him, you need to get to know Him. He's a good, good Father, as the song says. Let's uh, join together in praying. As we turn the service over to Caleb and the worship team. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here in your house. We ask you, Lord, for the anointing that destroys every yoke of bondage. We ask you, God, that you will minister and that you will move through the worship and your word. We commission the angels to stand amongst the property, Lord, and let them be in the building. We take authority over every assignment that would try to block your desire and your word. We pray over the homes of each one that is watching tonight. We ask you, God, to send angels to their homes right now. And Lord, let your Holy Spirit just saturate their living rooms or kitchen or wherever they might be, God. Lord, their car, wherever they're at, Father, move by your Spirit, Lord, upon each one. Father, we honor you. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. We give you all the glory. So, Lord, we invite you to have your way minister and move in Jesus that's the state. Are you ready to worship the Lord? Caleb, are you ready? Come on guys, let's give Jesus a big shout of praise. Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb. 
Come on, this place and fill the 
watching tonight, we ask you just to be in their homes right now, God. Let us have a heart of surrender. Let your praises 
Yeah, do that part. Let your glory fill this house one more time. One more time. Let your glory fill this house. Let your praise fill our mouths. Let each vessel offer up. Can we do one more? Online. Is it all right to do one more? I don't know how many is on there or not. Let's do this real slow. What can wash away my sins? What can make you hold again? Is anybody in? Online of you and those that are going to be watching. After this, I'm going to bring
chapter 4, I'm not going there, but he had to go through a battle zone and conquer the enemy. And how many know he defeated the devil with the word of God? Amen. Everybody knows that. You know that online. How many also know that when he started walking through the streets of Jerusalem and those areas, he went to a couple of brothers, James and John, and said, uh, come follow me. And he did. He went to Matthew and said, follow me. And he did. And they joined him and they followed him. The men that followed him had to make a decision. And if you're online and you're listening, I want you to listen close tonight. Because I believe that we're in a, a time such as we've never been in, in our lives. And there's more times to come, such as we've never seen. I don't read in my Bible, I know where he went to chase after the 90 and 9 and leave the 99 and go after the 1. And we know that that's what God does. But we also know, this is a bit of a rebuke to the church, that we find, Faye, hey, you guys looking for something? There's a black Bible and stuff over here in the front second row. Okay, they're, they're walking around the church while I'm talking trying to find something. So when there's not a lot of people in here, everybody's movement draws your attention. So forgive me. Thank you, Ronnie, for helping her. There's, there's a season and a time that we are in like what we've never been before. And... There's a line being drawn in the sand for the church. I don't see in my Bible where Jesus begged them to follow him. I don't see in my Bible where he was trying to say, let me do this and this so I can build my gathering of people. As a matter of fact, at one moment he had 5,000 and when he got done preaching to them, they all left. He caused his own church split. And then he tells them this, he says, if you're not willing to pick up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of me. Amen. He said some things that were to drive some away, if possible. The rich young ruler said, what do I need to do to have eternal life? He says, go give everything you have away and follow me and you'll be perfect. The young rich ruler said, you know, I've had all that stuff since I was young, I can't get rid of it. Basically, he walked off. I don't see where Jesus begged people to stay in his congregation. This is a harsh word tonight. I don't see where he begged them to come follow me. Please, I'm begging you. I'll multiply bread if you follow me. I'll multiply it twice. If you follow me, you get to watch me do some miracles. And you might even get to do one yourself. He didn't do any of that. He knew his mission and those that would follow him. And he invited them to be a part. Most of them followed him on their own. That's right. 
He chose a few, and the rest made the decision, I want to follow him. I believe he's the Messiah. I believe he's the Savior. A young man would go home that day. Maybe he's 20 years old, and he's a, a little fiery guy, and he heard the rumors the Messiah is coming, and he's all excited, and he says, man, I believe this guy's the Messiah, the Savior. And he goes home and tells his dad and says, Dad, you know the Messiah we've been waiting for? You know Joseph down the road, the third house on the right, the carpenter, his son, Jesus? Yeah, I know who you're talking about, son. He's the Messiah. And his dad's response would be, you've lost your mind, son. And his son would say, but I believe in him. I'm going to follow him. And his father would respond, if you do, I'll disinherit you. Catherine Kuhlman said, if you want him, it will cost you everything. Everything. This salvation is free, but it costs everything once you receive it. The church of today has a mindset of only go when it's convenient. I will only draw close to him when I really need it bad. And I will sacrifice a little, but I'll spend much time trying to figure out if I want to hang on to my old life or not. Can I tell you, in the Bible days, if you held on uh, to anything, you'd be in trouble. Because even though you're holding on to some old life, your new life will get you killed. That's right. There was a price to be paid. It was okay to get baptized anytime you wanted in the name of God. But when you made a declaration of getting baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the removing of my sins, the whole world that you lived in was about to turn against you. Remember the Apostle Paul when God called him and he said, He will experience much persecution because of me. You would think with all of his influence, a Pharisee of the highest degree, one of great authority and power, educated under Gamaliel, one of the greatest teachers, a young man that was revered as one of the great up-and-coming leaders of Jerusalem, you would think they would say, wow, let's follow him because he met Jesus. No, they said let's kill him because he met Jesus. The Bible's very clear. It says, if you really love me, the world will hate you. Amen. Come on. Amen. I know I'm painting a grim picture, but here's the reality of today. The church is in what I would call a press or a oil press, an olive press, so that the pressure is on and that which is for real is coming out. In other words, we either are a Christian or we're not. There may come a time when you can't have the I'm halfway in and halfway out mindset. We may face some situations that we have to make a decision. I'm all in or I'm all out. I'm going to tell you we have some fair women Christians in this society we live in in the United States of America. Christians that say, well, I'll serve God on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday I won't. I'll go back Sunday or I won't even go at all, but I love Jesus and I'm just fine. I'm going to tell you I have a feeling God is drawing a line in the sand and he's saying if you're my sheep, get on this side, and if you're the goats, get on this side. He's drawing a line. And the only way he can do that is when the pressure is put in. Yeah. There are probably some people that the church thinks are real strong in the Lord that will walk away from him in the coming future. There are probably some people that the church might think they're the weakest in the crowd and they might step up. Are you hearing me? Only God knows what's inside a man, but God will not have a church that is so filled with compromise, it looks more like the world than it does the body of Christ. Amen. Come on. Are you hearing me on Facebook? I believe this is the season where the true church is about to rise up. I believe this is the season where the church that is true is about to make some sense. 
that is strong against the enemy, that will be uncompromising, that will do whatever it takes in their hearts to say, I don't care what you do, I am serving my God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was thinking during the song that uh, uh, Caleb was leading us in, you deserve all the glory, you deserve all the praise. Do you know what that really means? That means to me that no matter what we go through, if you are a part of the true church, you listen to me. Whoever hears this, if you're a part of the true church of Jesus Christ, I don't care what you go through, you will find yourself whispering those words. I will praise Him no matter what. If I die, I'll praise Him. If I live, I'll praise Him. If I suffer, I'll praise Him. If I have peace, I'll praise Him. But as for me, I will praise the Lord. He'll begin to say, he deserves the glory. Oh, yeah. They are an uncompromising people, the church of Jesus Christ. There are people that will stand no matter what. Well, I was watching this past Friday, and this Friday, my mother is going to be again on Facebook, but this past Friday, as she was speaking, and her vocal cords are not used to speaking, she was gasping for air and it's like a new new journey for her to start stepping out and I, I believe that this is going to be an opportunity for her to do it more and more to strengthen her vocal cords and get her back uh, in that place of sharing the gospel of Christ but I was looking at her and I said my God I think someone might have wrote it on the uh, Facebook as a comment what a mighty woman of God something to that nature when you look at her and you say what has she been through? What has her life been about? She has stood the test of time. No matter what has gone on, there's always been, but I will praise the Lord. That's when you know that you know that you know that you know that you got him. When you don't know that you got him, you'll use any excuse to go walk with the world again. I'm telling you, don't think you're going to make it to heaven if you're just dancing with the devil all day long and you love Jesus in your heart because that might not be enough. Ouch, I'm sorry. There's coming a line, a decision time. Am I really going to serve him? The book of Daniel, chapter 3. I want to try to get through this chapter with you tonight. Daniel, chapter 3. Very interesting chapter. And I want to parallel to some of the things of today just a little bit. My God. Verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth was six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. It was about 12 and a half feet wide and 125 feet tall. And this thing was, was made out of gold, and he set it up. Why in the world did he do that? Because the kings of the world that don't have a heart after God want worship towards them. They want acknowledgement. They want their world to be glorified. What do they want the people to do? Bow down. Here's what's going on in the system of our society. This world as it is wants the church to bow down to it as it is. Are you hearing me? In every direction I look, it is if there is an unseen God trying to lift himself up and wants the entire system of the world, and I'm talking about the church world, to bend its knee to that idol. Listen now. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes and the governors and the captains and the judges and the treasurers and the counselors and the sheriffs and all the rulers of the province were gathered together to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar had made that the king had set up and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar set up. Then a herald cried out, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sacrament, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you will fall down and worship the golden image that the king has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship the same hour shall be cast into the midst of a burning fire. 
Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the circuit, the psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, the languages, bowed down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spoke and said, King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, has made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the instruments of praise shall worship your golden image. And whoever does not fall down to worship, he shall be cast into the midst of a fiery furnace. There are certain Jews, change the word Jews to Christians if you would. There are certain Christians whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor do they worship the golden image which you set up. Do you know who these guys were? They were guys that said, we will have no other god before us. Amen. That's who they were. It's amazing to me, I want you to listen to me close, that in the hour our nation lives in, listen to me close, the ordinary people, the ordinary people are looking at our governmental, political leadership and scratching our heads and saying, what in the world are they doing allowing this stuff to go on? Are you right? I, I, I see it. It's as if those that are the smaller people in this society, you and I and others, were wondering, what is going on? What is going on? Why would you let people destroy and people do whatever they want and not stop them? And this may seem a little controversial, but I want you to understand something. The idol that was set up was designed... Not for the little people. It was for the leadership. That's who was invited to the dedication. It gives you a list. The princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and the rulers of the province. They were the ones invited to bow down before the God that was being set up. Listen to me. The government right now and many officials are being forced and pushed by the pressure of their constituents and people around them that elected them, they're being pressured to bow their knee to a society that is turning to rebelliousness and anarchy. They're bending their knee and they're turning their head and it's a terrible thing, but the large portion of leaders are bowing their knee to the God that's being raised right now in our world. Are you hearing me? What God is that it's a God of fear. It's a God of rebellion. It's a God of pressure. I'll lose my position. It really is. And when I read this, I said, I never saw that before God. When he set this idol up, this great uh, statue to worship it, the leaders were invited to the dedication. Why? Because if the leaders bend their knee, everyone else will follow. Are you hearing me? But thank God for a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Amen. Only three out of thousands of leaders, only three out of thousands of leaders said, we will not bend our knee. Now let me make a little shift here and say, who are the leaders of the day that we live in? We can talk about the political side of that, but I'm going to tell you, the political side, the governmental people are not the leaders of this day. The Lord Jesus Christ is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the body of Christ is that unseen, that hidden leader that is on the backside and going to say to the church don't bend your knee like leaders are all around the nation I need the three Hebrew boys to stand up they're called the church of Jesus Christ can we even get a little spiritual and say it represents the Father Son, the Holy Spirit in three and there's a church that he rose up that's a mighty army and God is saying do not bow down 
12. There are certain Jews whom you have sent over the affairs of the prophets of Babylon. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not your gods, nor do they worship the golden image which you set up. I hope, just hope I fall into some of that category. Because I do not regard hate. I do not regard violence. And I won't play into anybody's power mongering that tries to make me do it. My God is a God of love. He's a God of authority. He's a God of power. I will not bend my knee to anything that tries to suck me in that is away from God's word. God's word is a standard by which we stand. It's the plumb bob. It is that moral compass for the church of Jesus Christ. This world will turn against the church. Government officials will turn against the church. But the church must make a decision in the midst of threat, in the midst of possible fiery furnace, in the midst of all that can come. What will we do when the world bows its knee to the enemy's idol? What will we do? Well, Brother Dave, I'll stand. I know. You already stood pretty good. Oh, this is going to sting. When that movie that was filled with pornography and violence, and you said, it's all right if I watch it. <laughs> we already bowed our knee when we say he set me free from that, but I'll go do it one more time. We bowed our knee. Come on. That's right. We worship the Lord and speak in tongues. And then we turn our head and we cuss our neighbor out. We've already bowed our knee. Come on. Somewhere the church has got to make a decision and say, who am I? I'm not condemning people for making mistakes or failures. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the church that says, I can live in an utter compromised position and still call myself a Christian and I'm good to go. When Galatians chapter 5 says, if you do these things, if this is your lifestyle, you can't inherit the kingdom of heaven. I didn't write the book he did. There's a separation. We're a new creature in him. All things, old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. He calls us to faith and holiness and purity. Not that we walk in perfection. We're going to make mistakes. But here's the thing I love about the true church. If they fall, they get back up. They go to the altar. They cry. They're remorseful and say, God, forgive me. Wash me again. Strengthen me. And let's do it one more time. And if they slip and fall, they get back up. But the false church will stay and waller back in the old vomit, in the old mud. And then they'll still get Sunday morning and dress themselves up and say, I'm just a good Christian, and they'll wall it back in. That is not Christianity. That's hypocrisy. That's right. it's compromise. And when it comes down to it, those people will run as fast as they can to bow down their knee to the gods this world is presenting. Are you with me? Sorry, this might be a Sunday morning message, but you're getting it. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury. Bring me those three men. Bring me Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They brought him before the king. They brought him before the world. And the world said unto them, Is it true you won't worship the way we want you to? Is it true that you won't serve the God that we are promoting? Is it true you won't buy into what? Asking you to buy into everybody else. Is it true you're standing out? Is it true you won't bend your knee to what we've set up? Then the king gave them a second chance. That's crazy to me. Verse 15. If you're ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the circuit, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all the kinds of music, just fall down and worship the image which I have made. Just fall down and worship the image that I have made. Are you with me or is it my imagination? I see an image being put up. We, they may be tearing down all kinds of statues all over the world. We won't get into that. They may be destroying businesses and homes and lives and authorities. But at the same time, they're building an image for the world to worship. It's an image filled with hatred and rebellion. It's an image that fills the, fulfills the scriptures. 
when men will be loving themselves only, disobedient to parents. And as the Bible says in Noah's day, every thought becoming on violence and anger, every thought. Listen. Now, if you're ready, bow down. But if you worship not, you'll be cast in the same hour into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. This is the mistake of the world right now. I want you to listen closely. The world of rebellion right now is screaming, who is the God that shall deliver you out of our hands? I'm not speaking about someone standing for an injustice being done. I'm speaking about the rebelliousness and the antichrist spirit that has been loosed upon our nation like nothing I've ever seen. Have you read some of the signs? Many of them, it's just about Jesus. I mean, one of the signs that Jesus is, is coming back as a transgendered woman. I mean, and I'm not attacking anybody. I'm saying this is the rebellious. It's against Christianity. Are you understanding? The only moral compass for the world, the only moral compass for the United States of America is God's word and the foundation by which we were built upon, the love and the foundation of Jesus Christ. And the enemy is doing his best to break that foundation down. Are you with me? And they're saying, who's the God? If you watch any of the news, if you watch any of the late night comedians or whatever those shows are, they're mockers of God. They're mockers of Christianity. They're in the face of people saying, who is the God that can stop this thing? The king says, I'm going to give you one more chance or it's going to get really bad on you. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. <laughs> we are not careful. What in the world? You see, the Christian that's not really a Christian would say, Wow, what if we bent one knee halfway down? Do you think we could get away with that? But the one that knows says, the answer's already made. If you are a true Christian and someone says, deny him or you're going to die, you don't have a choice. Listen to me, there is no choice. You can look them in the face and you can say, I can speak the words. I deny him, but it will be untrue. You'll have to shoot me because my heart will be screaming, I can't, because I know him. I'm in covenant with him. He is my God, and there's nothing man can do to stop that. The choice is made. When you make the full-blown decision, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. These guys said, we're not careful. You don't have to think about this. We don't have to go in the corner and debate about it. We don't got to call a lawyer. We have the answer now, O king. <clears throat> we're not going to bow down to your God. Listen, I'm going to read it this way. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. If it be so, if it be so, our God whom we serve, he is able to deliver us from the burning fire and furnace. Amen. And he will deliver us out of your hand. But if not, but if not, you know, there's so many people, please forgive me, those of you that are really religious on Facebook listening to me. There's so many people that, that condemn you if you say, if God don't do it. Oh, you got to just speak positive and speak life constantly. I'm going to tell you, I agree with that message, but it gets twisted up when you can't look at reality and still have faith. Are you hearing me? They said, we know our God is able to deliver us. We will not bow down. And we know he can get us free from the fiery furnace. But if he don't, it's okay. Because we are sold out, signed, sealed, delivered. It's done, O King. 
Sometimes I don't know what he's going to do. I want him to do what I think he should do, but sometimes he just does what he wants to do. And my job is to say, am I really a Christian? Because if I am, I trust him in the good, I trust him in the bad. Are you with me? If it be so, our God, verse 17, whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will, somehow, he will, one way or another, deliver us out of your hands. You know what they were saying? We might die or we might walk out. We don't know, but we're out of your hands. Amen. Your hands are not greater than his hands. Yeah. Are you hearing me? 18. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your God, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. There needs to be a church of Jesus Christ that says, I don't care about the naysayers. I don't care about the news. I don't care about the leaders that speak one way or another. We will not bow our knee to the God that's being set up. Period. Amen. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. Oh, my. He was really mad. And his facial features changed towards Shadrach. He was angry at them. So he said... And he commanded that they should heat the furnace seven times hotter. I don't care if the enemy heats it a thousand times hotter. God will either let you burn or he will bring you out. That's God. He can and he will do what pleases him. You could be a Stephen that gets stoned and you could say, I serve the Lord. I see Jesus standing at the right hand of power. Or you could be a Paul that was stoned and rose back up and went back into the city and preached. Now, all this matters is do you really serve the living God? Come on. He commanded the most mighty men that were in his army. God did this on purpose, by the way, in my opinion. To bind up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the furnace, the fiery furnace. And these men were bound in their coats, in their tunics, and in their turbans, and their other garments. And they cast them into the burning fiery furnace. You know why they, they, they bound them up in their clothes and all that? So they catch on fire quick. Because all that stuff is flammable. So we'll leave their clothes on and get them burned good. We'll just, they're going to hurt. They're just going to start on the outside and just slowly work the way you listen. Therefore, because the king's command was so urgent, the furnace is exceedingly hot. The flames of the fire killed the men that took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the fiery furnace. Now understand, these three men made a spectacle of the entire nation of that day. Because the king made an image 125 feet tall and says, everyone bow down. Could you imagine the embarrassment in the king's face? All these thousands of people were on their face worshiping his idol, and he's gloating, feeling pretty good about himself. I've got them all. i got them all. They're all going to bend to me. They're all afraid. They all know there's a punishment. They all know that I'm the one that's in control. They all know that I'm going to handle things my way. And they look at who, what, what, what's going on down there? Who are those three guys? Those are the three that said, we will not worship your God. Can you imagine? Here's what I think happened. The music stops. And people kneeling down start looking up at them. And slowly but surely, I think the whole crowd was now standing. And I think the whole crowd is watching the punishment on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is what I think happened. Okay? Verse 23. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down at first into the fire furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished. He rose up quickly, and he spoke and said to his counselors, Hey, hey, guys, didn't we cast three men down into the midst of fire? They said, Yes, O king, we did. He said to them, um, Why do I see four men? Why are they loose? Why are they walking in the middle of the fire and have no hurt? And why does one of them look like a god or an angel or something? Do you 
you see what's going on? When the church will make her stance, it may be a time of fire, but there's a God that says, I will always be the fourth man in your fire. I will never leave you nor forsake you. You just got to decide, am I your God or am I not? Listen, he is calling a church of Jesus Christ in this hour. She's not one, she's not two, she's not three, but she's thousands and millions of Christians that are true Christians. And he is saying to the church, you better not bow down to the God that's being resurrected or lifted up before you. You better not bow your knee for I am your God. Yes. And I'll be with you in the midst of the fire. Now here's what I like. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the, ferny, of the burning fiery furnace. And he said, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, listen you servants of the Most High God. <laughs> he changed his attitude, didn't he? Come out! Come to me! And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. And the princes and the governors and the captains and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power. Do you understand? When the world sees the church that the fires that are out there and the gods that are out there have no power against, the world will say, who is the God that you guys serve? Yeah. He's certainly greater than the one that we've raised up. Neither was the hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor did they smell like fire. Nothing touched them. Because the fourth man was with them. Why? Because they said, as for me, my house, we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God to salvation. There's no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved but the name of Jesus. Then Nebuchadnezzar Change his mind. Then the world changes mind. I'm not going to say all the world will change, but your world can change when it sees the God that we serve. Amen. Then Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word. And yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people and nation and language which speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces. Their houses shall be made dunghill because there is no other god that can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> Oh, with God. It may cost some Christians everything. But God does not lose. And there's a remnant of people that will not bend in me. And they will stand. And the whole world will know the God that they serve. You know in the Bible it says in the last days there's going to be two witnesses in Jerusalem and they're going to preach an evangelistic message and the Bible says that the people will kill them and their bodies will lay in the streets I think for like three days. Can you imagine? How would the world know about it except for social media? We now live in a time where you can see anything that goes on anywhere in the world immediately. Can you imagine two dead men laying in the streets of Jerusalem? The world rejoicing because we killed those prophets that are preaching Jesus Christ. And three days later, their eyeballs open and they stand up. And the whole world sees it. My, my, my. Who is that God that they serve? 
He's the God that created the heavens and the earth. He's the God that can forgive the sins of a man and transform his life and make him a new person. He's the God that performs miracles and his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He's the God that can cause a quail to land for you to eat or manna to grow out of the ground. He's the God that can bring water out of a rock or cause the sea to park just so you can go across. He's the God that can take a young boy with a slingshot and a stone and kill a giant of a man and defeat the enemies. He's a God that can crush a lion with a man's bare hands because of the power that he puts through him. He's the God that can speak to an army that is trying to come down and he can show the prophet there's more for you than against you and the entire army goes blind. You understand? He's the God that can say to the leper who was a soldier that was against God's man, say, go dip in the river Jordan seven times and guess what? You'll come out totally healed. He's the God that has proved himself a thousand times plus a thousand times plus a thousand times. And he will not stop doing it because he is God. And the Bible says he wins at the end. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess he is Lord. Every man, woman, child, boy, and girl, dead and alive, will all stand before the judgment seat of God one day and give an account for the life. He is God. He created the heavens and the earth. And he gave life into man. Amen. And we will stand before. We can scream, we can yell, we can shoot, we can burn, we can pillage, we can be violent as we want. We can scream at anybody and we can murder and we can hurt, but we will stand before God. Choose you this day who you will serve. If God is God, serve him. If Baal is God, then serve him. One day God said, I'm sending fire from heaven and I'll show you who God really is. And another day he did it. His name was Jesus. He died, and then three days later, he rose again. That's the gospel message. The good news. He's alive. He's alive. The world said, we killed him. We stopped him, and God says, no, you can't. It won't work. They hung him on the tree. They watched him breathe his last breath. They put him in a tomb, and they sealed it. And they said, he's not coming back. Three days later, the stone was rolled away. And Jesus came out the victor. God always wins. Is he your God tonight? Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for each one that is here. I thank you for these on Facebook. And those that will view this message, Lord, later on, let us make sure that we know who our God is. And Father, in the midst of the press, let us not bow our knee to the God that is standing. Let us bow our knee to God that made me. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all said, Amen. Amen. We love you. God bless you.